This is the City of Wapanka City Plan Commission meeting. All right, it's uh, actually 5.16 p.m., so we'll go ahead and get started. Uh, we have a public hearing uh, that we need to take care of, first of all. So before we start the regular City Planning Commission meeting, uh, so this uh, public hearing has to do with, I, I hope I'm saying this right, it's Aka, Akapa LLC, which is at 1080 uh, West Fulton Street. Nobody's correcting right. me, so I'm assuming I'm okay there. No one uh, wants to take a shot at it. <laughs> uh, so just so uh, I make sure for in attendance for our commissioners tonight, I see we have Pat Fair, uh, Eric Olson, Tracy Barrett, Alan Keelan, Justin Barons, uh, Mayor Brian Smith, myself. And then we have staff. We have uh, uh, Aaron Jensen and we have Jeff Sanders. I don't know. Is, is Andrew Dane on? He, he's not tonight. No. Okay. All right. So am I missing any of the commissioners or staff? Uh, did you say Angela Lesage? I did not. I'm sorry. Sorry, Angie. I'll uh, forgive Angela, you. Yeah. Well, I always say your last name wrong anyway, so I don't want to do that tonight. Uh, so, and Angela Lesage is also uh, with us tonight. Uh, so let's uh, go ahead with the uh, conditional use permit uh, request in Am I turning this over to Jeff, or are you handling this, Aaron? I think Jeff can best explain uh, the reason for the conditional use permit with this project. Thank you, Aaron. Good evening, uh, Mr. Mayor and Plan Commission members. Um, as indicated in your packets, the uh, proposed use, um, coffee, tea, juice, and smoothie shops, restaurants with drive-ins, and fast food restaurants uh, require a conditional use permit in the B4 Strip Commercial District. Um, and as per state statutes, every conditional use permit must go before public hearing. And that's why we're here tonight. All right. Thanks. Um, and so uh, when we're talking about this property, just so everybody's aware where this property is, you want to, Aaron, you want to just explain what that property is? Yeah, this is uh, what most people would know as the old Pizza Hut uh, building. Uh, we will be talking later in the agenda tonight about the redevelopment of that site uh, from this company you see on, on the screen. All right. So, and when we do public hearings, when we do them virtually like we are, we request that uh, people send in letters, uh, whether they're uh, in favor of the conditional use permit or uh, not in favor of the conditional use. And Aaron, I understand we we don't have either. That's correct, Mayor. Okay, so that would leave it to anybody that's on the meeting tonight, if they would like to give any uh, testimony in favor of or against uh, the uh, conditional use for this property. And obviously we're gonna talk about this more when we get to our city planning commission. This is just a public hearing, given the opportunity for the public to, to just speak uh, on their thoughts on this property. <laughs> So uh, I'm not hearing any, so I, I'm just going to declare this hearing closed uh, at uh, 5.20 p.m. And we'll just go right into our city planning commission meeting. They don't always go that smooth, by the way. <laughs> All right, uh, let's uh, start with the... Uh, City Planning Commission meeting uh, today is Wednesday, March 3rd, uh, 2021, and it is uh, 5.20 p.m., and I'll call this City Planning Commission meeting to order. And again, I'll just uh, try and name off the commissioners first. It's uh, Mayor Brian Smith, Smith uh, Pat Fair, Eric Olson, Alan Keelan, Angela Barron, Angela Lesage. Tracy Barrett, uh, 
Justin Barons. Uh, and then staff, we have uh, Aaron Jensen and Jeff Sanders. So again, did I miss anybody? I even added a few names so to the list. And then, uh, I mean, I see we have a few guests tonight. So, I mean, let's just get them on the record right now. And, and I see that Lynn Sarr is is with us. And I know that, uh, uh, is it Malachi? You uh, called no, Lynn? It's, no, right? it's Roxanne. It's Roxanne. Sorry, I'm his daughter. Oh, Some reason, right. I can't get logged in with my account for some reason. Okay. So it's Roxanne and that's uh, Lynn's daughter. And then we, and I notice up in my upper left hand corner, we also have uh, Adam Stein and who are, I'm sure Aaron knows this and Jeff does too, but Adam, who are you representing tonight? Uh, so I'm the architect of logic. Uh, I'm representing uh, the conditional use that you're talking about right now. As well as the site plan review. Okay. Awesome. And um, Mark Seidel is my civil engineer that's on the line. And then John Halborough is the owner who is also on the call. Okay. All right. Well, I'm only seeing you, so you're the one I picked on. So <laughs> the other ones are down on the bottom here. All right. Uh, so having all that on there, uh, we have an agenda in front of us. And uh, I, I would need a motion to approve the agenda from the commissioners. So move for approval, Fair. Olson, second. Uh, motion by Fair, second by Olson that we approve the agenda. Any discussion on that? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against, say no. Motion carried. And then we have minutes. Uh, we're just doing some uh, cleanup work for you, those of you that are just attending for the first time. But we have a uh, planning commission meeting from February 3rd. Uh, we usually uh, we do uh, approve those at the following meeting so that we can place those on file. Uh, unless you see anything that needs to be changed on there, commissioners. Again, I would like to get an approval on that. Uh, so move, Tracy. Thank you, Trey. Keelan, second. All right, we got a motion by Barron, second by Keelan to approve the uh, Planning Commission minutes from uh, February 3rd, 2021. Any discussion? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Aye. Uh, uh, okay, and motion carried. I said that a little fast there. All right, uh, let's go under action items. And Aaron, I'm going to let you uh, just set it up first and then, or Jeff, one of the two here. But uh, conditional use permit uh, for 1080 West Fulton Street. Yeah, absolutely. So I'll be very brief. But as we talked about in the public hearing, this is uh, 1080 West Fulton Street, what people know as the old Pizza Hut building. I've been in touch uh, mainly with John Holborough. John's on the meeting uh, today and working through this process with us. Um, the conditional use permit is for the type of uh, use that they're planning to use, which is um, you, a coffee shop. Um, he'll get into that a little later. Um, and I'll let uh, Jeff take you through all of the uh, the report that he came up with for the conditional use permit application. So, Jeff, take it away. Uh, thank you, Aaron. Again, thank you, Plan Commission members. Can you hear me okay with this microphone? Yes. Yep. Yep. Good. I thought it might be a little bit clearer than the other one. Uh, so what I won't do is read through the entire report. You have it in front of you. I'll try to summarize kind of the key elements of it, and then we will uh, get to whatever questions you may have. Um, the nuts and bolts of it is they're compliant with uh, all the requirements of the conditional use permit um, under the zoning ordinance. Um, and I inadvertently brought up the site plan review document instead of the CUP. Apologies for that. Um, Aaron, could you blow that up a little bit. Yes, sir. And I'll do the same here with my document. Sorry for the delay, everyone. I just opened up the wrong document, went with the site plan first prior to the conditional use permit. Uh, so as we mentioned, the comprehensive plan sets the standards for planned commercial. Um, the proposed use is com consistent with the comprehensive plan. 
Uh, it's also consistent with the zoning ordinance. We mentioned briefly that coffee, tea, juice, and smoothie shops, restaurants, drive-in, and restaurants, fast food are all listed as conditional uses in the B4 district. Um, as we've discussed in the past, Act 67, which was passed in November of 2017, sets specific standards uh, for the conditions upon which, or the conditions for which the city of Wapaka can regulate or administer and regulate conditional uses. And those are listed below you on page two <clears throat> for the conditions for which. And then the guts of the report is when we get to the CPC recommendations or my recommendations on the bottom of page three, um, these are the conditions that we would place upon the conditional use permit if approved. Um, these conditions, again, must be, cons must be consistent with the purpose of the ordinance. Uh, they must be based upon substantial evidence and they must be measurable if practicable. Um, the, the, one of the first condition would be that the approved site plan um, be agree the agreed upon site plan, the authorized site plan that we'll be talking about in a little bit, uh, must be complied with. Uh, that deliveries can occur 24 hours a day, but between the hours of 10 p.m. and 7 a.m., they have to be um, quieter deliveries as opposed to louder deliveries. Uh, storage is entirely inside. There'll be no external storage allowed. Uh, the property must be maintained in all ways, but including free from accumulation and trash and debris. That's something that's kind of typical of fast food restaurants in general. Um, and then the last ones are just kind of caveats. Every Any change to the site, um, any change to existing structures, the addition of a, a, a new use would trigger or could trigger a requirement for the conditional use permit to be amended. And finally, the CUP itself will be valid for as long as the use is maintained. So as long as this structure and this property uh, continues with the use is covered under the CUP, there will be no renewal required. And that's all I have. All right. All right. Uh, thank you, Jeff. Um, so at this time, would it, is there anybody that's representing uh, this? project that would like to speak to the commission? <clears throat> sure. Uh, can everyone hear me okay? My name is John Halborough. I'm the current owner of the property. Yeah, we can hear you fine, John. Okay, great. Um, so we um, obviously purchased the property earlier, uh, or I guess the end of last year, um, with the intent uh, to approach a tenant for uh, a reuse of that property for demolition of the existing Pizza Hut building and a reuse of that property. Um, we obviously appreciate all the time and consideration that Aaron and Jeff and uh, the city staff have put forth. We have no issues with the conditions that are set forth uh, here in the recommendation. And um, uh, so obviously we're, we're looking forward to moving forward. Okay. Anybody else? Uh, commissioners, do you have uh, any questions of anybody, Jeff or John, or anybody that's in attendance? Okay. Uh, so what we're looking for tonight is approval of that conditional use permit for John pronounce am I was I saying it right before you, you were the you know it's funny when I when I filed the LLC on the Wisconsin uh, Department of Financial Institutions website the intent was just to spell Wapaka backwards but oh. in the paw portion of it I got the U and the A I just I didn't switch the U and the A so it's Wapaka backwards Akapa. so yep <laughs> you're, you are correct I'm not very good at those word games, so I wouldn't have even noticed anyways. <laughs> there was no rhyme or reason. I mean, I was literally sitting there. What? Okay, what should I form? This? So yeah, that was what came to mind. Okay, thanks. Yep. All right. Uh, so uh, we'd be looking for a motion to approve the <coughs> conditional use permit for Aquapaw LLC. Keelan, motion to approve. Fair second. Motion by Keelan, second by Fair, that we approve the conditional use permit for Acapa LLC, 1080 West Fulton Street. Any uh, discussion? All right. Uh, all in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against, say no. 
Anybody that needs to or would like to abstain? Uh, all right, uh, motion carried. Let's move on then to the uh, site plan review for the <coughs> same property. And Jeff, am I turning that back over to you again here? Uh, with Aaron's approval, that would be correct. Okay. So approved, Jeff. <laughs> All right, so this is going to be a little bit more complex than a conditional use permit. Um, I want to, you know, start off by complimenting Mr. Stein and his colleagues. Um, it was a very, very well prepared site plan application. Uh, it made this review, well, it made the review rather easy. Um, so we'll walk through each of the sections um, with the plan commission's approval. I'd be happy to stop at any point to answer any questions. Uh, you do not have to wait. By all means, do not have to wait until I stop talking or. You may not have a chance to talk. Um, the zoning ordinance itself, the dimensional standards, as you'll notice, they're compliant with each of the requirements here. I'm on the bottom of page one at present. We talked already about the proposed use. It's a restaurant drive-in coffee, tea, juice, and smoothie shop, um, also a fast food restaurant. It's located within the Fulton Street corridor. And um, because the Fulton Street corridor had not been established on the city of Wapaka zoning map when this review occurred, we could not impose any of the conditions of the Fulton Street corridor on this proposed development. Um, so the information is up there more as a placeholder and a reminder of things to come than anything that we would anything that we would impose at this time. But I did put it up there because many of the conditions that would have to be met under the Fulton Street corridor were met by the applicants as they submitted or when they submitted their application. And you'll see those standards on the bottom page too. Go ahead. Jeff, can I just interrupt? So so we're looking at the uh, Fulton Street overlay uh, district and, and as you mentioned, they, they don't apply in this particular case, but had they applied, you mentioned there were some, most of the things were, were, were followed. What what would jump off uh, as a commissioner? What would jump off of this page that they would have to do differently? Uh, that's a great question, Mr. Fair, and I'm not sure I could answer that question with any with any certainty right now because when I went through the list um, of what was included within the site plan, first of all, they met every requirement of the actual site plan review section of the zoning ordinance. Um, but the purpose of the Fulton Street Corridor, as the Plan Commission knows, is to gradually evolve an existing historic commercial corridor into something of a more vibrant mixed-use development. And the property owners and their consultants must have looked at the ordinance because that's what they put together. Um, as you'll see when we get into the actual site plan drawings, um, they met the pedestrian oriented requirements, the bicycle oriented requirements, all the landscape requirements. Um, the, um, the, the development, the development itself, itself is a very, a very welcoming, welcoming, well, welcome, welcome to Fulton Street, Street Quarter. Street Quarter. I, apologize, I apologize, I'm getting, I'm some, getting feedback some feedback right now. Right now. Is that, is that everybody it's else? Probably, it's that? probably me, let me, I'm having some issues here, so. So, Mr. Fair, if, if you got that, um, I wish I could point out specifically something they missed if they had to have complied with, if they were to have complied with the Fulton Street Corridor, if that was required. I, I don't know of any offhand. They did a, again, they did a very, very well, very good job of complying with their requirements. Okay. So, my follow-up question would simply be from, from uh, uh, January 1st of this year or February 1st, will these then have to be taken into account for any future development? Uh, yes, sir. The moment that the plan commission recommended and common council approved the amended zoning map, which is now the official zoning map of the city of Wapaka, the Fulton Street corridor is, well, it's fully established under the zoning code and any development or redevelopment that occurs within the footprint of the B4 parcels within the West Fulton Street corridor must comply with all of the requirements as applicable in the Fulton Street corridor overlay. Um, in this case, if uh, if for some reason the um, proposed development at 1080 were to not comply in some aspect, and if they were to change the use or add an additional structure, that would trigger compliance requirements for them as well. But as again, I, I'm not sure I could find a, a, a part of the Fulton Street Court overlay that they did not comply with. 
Okay, thank you. You're welcome. Uh, from the standards of site plan review, section five, we're now at the top or middle of page three. What I've done is tried to break this down into the various sections under site plan review. Um, I hope it makes it a little bit easier for all parties, whether it be plan commission members, the applicants and the general public to kind of follow the you know, compliant or not compliant elements of this. Um, Aaron, if it's possible while I'm talking through this, could you actually bring up some of the design drawings for the proposed structure? Because I think that's applicable, applicable yeah. now. Yeah, I can. Preferably look. the uh, color concept drawings okay. right there perfect uh, so the design standards require that there be a certain 30 percent of the facade be of something that is more appealing than the kind of conventional um, development that might occur within a commercial corridor uh, that material has to extend at least 20 feet along the sides clearly in this case they've really wrapped the entire structure uh, in a manner compliant with our requirements uh, the colors shall be selected in harmony with the existing neighborhood buildings. And if you drive down, if you if you take a mental image of this of these uh, drawings that you're looking at, and you drive down that part of the corridor, you'll see they paid not inconsiderable attention to making sure that they blend in with the existing landscape. Um, there are no accessory structures proposed, so that's inapplicable. Um, so the next three, and as I mentioned earlier. Uh, there's no outside storage approved or proposed, so that's not applicable. And finally, there's no mechanical equipment that'll be located on the roof or around it. So again, that's there's no necessary, there's no requirement for that shielding. I'll just stop there for a moment and see if anybody has any questions regarding the design of the building itself. <clears throat> if not, we'll jump into the site design standards. So this would be on page four of your application. Uh, buildings and uses must maintain the existing topography. It's not really applicable here because again, we're looking at a redeveloped site. Um, buildings have to accommodate safe traffic circulation, safe driveway locations. They've done so quite well. Um, I think when we get to the site plan uh, visual for the traffic flow on the site, you'll notice how um, the separate, how the proposed separation of various transportation uses occur on the property. So where vehicles pull in, where vehicles park, when vehicles queue up in line to the ordering booth, where they wait once their order has been placed, where pedestrians access the site back and forth. I mean, it's all laid out quite well. So um, it, it really, it will minimize any potential uh, negative interactions between car traffic and pedestrian and bicycle traffic. Uh, the appropriate buffer shall be provided between dissimilar uses. In this case, that's not really applicable because the uses surrounding this, but for the residential uses some distance to the north, um, are all similar in nature. Um, but they've done, I would argue, an exceptional job on the landscaping element we'll get to in a moment. And refuse and recycling area shall be screened by completely enclosing. And again, Aaron, if you wouldn't mind bringing up some of those illustrations or some of those drawings, we can probably go right to that one and stay there right now while I talk through the, um, the actual report itself. But I think if you could scroll down to, I don't recall what it's called. I believe it was the one that had all the landscaping on it. We can use that as the basis for discussion right now. That's it, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, any questions about the site design comments I just made or the diagram you see in front of you aside from the landscaping element? <clears throat> As you'll notice, and this isn't the actual traffic flow diagram, that's a different drawing, but it shows exactly where vehicles will enter, how they'll move through the site. Uh, you can see the walkways associated with pedestrian access. Uh, you can see that the places where people might be dining outside of the coffee shop are well protected, both structurally with barriers, uh, but also visually with a variety of different kinds of landscaping elements. And if there are no questions from the plan commission, I'll bump down to the landscaping section. Um, Jeff, I just had one question. Is there any difference in, in uh, on this uh, site now in terms of uh, access? Uh, are they using the same access points that the old facility was using or are, are some new things being cut in here? 
Yeah, that's a great question. Honestly, I would defer to Aaron and Justin on that. They're far more familiar with the existing site. Um, I think my familiarity with what's proposed is pretty good, but my familiarity with the existing property is not nearly what those of you in this room are in, are in line with. Aaron, Aaron, Justin? You want me to take it? Just, yeah, go ahead, Justin. <clears throat> the the driveway entrance on the east side where Joanne Lane is about the same spot as it currently is. Um, it looks, according to the plan, though, that's going to be a brand new apron they're going to pour there. The entrance on the west side is in a different location. Uh, the existing is probably like halfway um, from the property lines, the north property line and south property line. This is shifted further south, close to the intersection. Um, so that's how it is in relation to what's already out there. Justin, yeah, Justin do you, this is the mayor. Uh, <clears throat> do you see that as an issue getting closer to, to the Fulton Street? With that exit? No, we don't. It um, it still meets our standards. Uh, driveways can't. I I want to say it's like 50 feet from an intersection. It's far enough back. Um, it does not meet or exceed that. Um, it's adjacent to the one Burger King driveway um, on the west side there, so it should work just fine. Okay. Any other questions regarding the site itself? Not the details regarding landscaping or parking, but just the site overall. From a landscaping standpoint, um, as you can see, and again, Aaron, I'm not sure how much you can blow that up right now to focus on the site, but if my count was correct, I think it was three, <coughs> excuse me, I think it was 316 individual plantings that were included in the site plan. Again, it's I mean, remarkable is probably a word that's overused, but it's a very, very well-designed landscape plan, um, not only for the diversity of the species, but the, the manner in which those species are placed upon the site and the purposes that each one of those uh, plant species and the purpose that each one of those plant species serve. Um, I think if, uh, I don't know if we have digital images of the, um, switchgrass on the right on the eastern boundary <clears throat> uh, right here all right so basically that shading that you saw on the eastern um, side of the parcel is a species of switchgrass that looks very similar if not identical to what you're looking at now uh, it grows to about five to six feet in height provides you know almost complete opaqueness so um, it's the intent of that portion of the landscaping to diminish the view of the parking area from off-site will be easily addressed um, via this particular uh, landscaping strategy. Um, the, the only concern that is out there to a degree and not so much anymore is that, again, when you have lots of heavy snowfall, uh, the plants can compress. Um, once that snow melts, they tend to pop right back up. But the best... Uh, the best argument I would make for northern switchgrass is it's incredibly beautiful. Um, right now, it, you know, you're looking at a picture in the middle of winter. It shows it to be more brown than it really is. It tends to be more of a, a brownish silver, almost a bronzish look. Um, and then through the summer, it's just an incredibly beautiful thing to look at. So, again, I, forgive me for gushing a little bit. Um, my background is in environmental planning, and when I see landscape plans like this, it just makes me feel good inside. Um, as far as the uh, as far as the remainder of the species, I think I'd like Justin to weigh in a little bit on the trees. Um, we did have some questions. I think we may have had some questions and comments regarding the uh, proposed crabapple trees, their coverage, and what uh, impacts they might have on pedestrians. Um, not in a negative way, but I think just a question. Justin, did you want to jump in? Yeah, if you can just kind of scroll down a little bit, Aaron. The this the one comment or concern came up with just the location there's two trees um right next to that walkway leading in um you know they're very close to that walkway and we just wanted the designers planners to review that and make sure that wouldn't be a future issue i guess with people bumping into them sticks branches for the walkway so outside of that i concur with jeff uh we looked at this plan and the landscaping plan, and was very impressed. 
Yeah, I have nothing to add uh, that hasn't already been said other than working with John and, and uh, the crew was uh, was very good from all of our staff's point of view. So, You know, it's uh, uh, good to see this, too, only from a standpoint, too, that, uh, you know, that's a pavement of blacktop and cement out there, too. So it's nice to see some green space. Uh, on some property to really make it look, uh, mix it up a little bit and make it look a lot nicer out there. Uh, Jeff, I just want to make sure that picture that they showed of those, that long grass there, that was a winter picture, right? That's not a summer picture. <laughs> I, I certainly hope that's a winter picture. Yes, sir. Okay. Thanks. Yeah. And I think one other thing to add too, and this is a little bit of an aside, but given the location of this property, it is almost the front door of the city of Wapaka, at least with respect to Fulton Street. So anything that occurs on this property, good or bad, would be, well, perhaps a bar setter for anything that follows it, right? And I do believe that, uh, that the property owners and the consultants working on this have created a pretty nice welcome to the city of Wapaka. So um, again, I don't tend to be this hyperbolic. I am just rather impressed by the quality of the site plan. Um, as far as the, uh, as far as the parking and access go, um, again, they're compliant with all the requirements. Um, the one question we had was um, buffer shell uh, and Aaron, I think, or I'm sorry, plan commission members at the top of page seven, um, buffer shell incorporates some combination of shrubs, burning, and deciduous and coniferous trees, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, the only reason I wrote uncertain there was, again, the question from the plant commission standpoint of whether you're comfortable with the primary eastern buffer being this particular grass species mix. Um, from a staff standpoint, I am, um, but it is a little bit, I think, out of the out of the norm or a little bit unconventional for um, what WAPAC has seen in the past. We tend to see arborvita and some other plants that are used for screening. This is something uh, a little bit different. Okay, awesome. They meet, all the Go ahead, Jeff. Uh, they meet all the requirements for parking. Um, and you'll notice my recommendations at the bottom um, are pretty simple. Um, we wanna make sure that the plan commission is comfortable with the proposed landscape plan, particularly the buffering for the, uh, for the parking area. And then the rest are just, you know, can't begin doing this until you have all the appropriate permits. And I believe the applicants have indicated that no signs will be installed as part of the site plan. When the tenant, um, when the final tenant moves in, uh, they will move forward with applications for appropriate sign permits. So that's all I have other than questions. All right. Thank you, Jeff. Any uh, commissioners or staff that have some questions or comments that they would like to make? Uh, Brian, this is Pat. Could you just remind us again where we go from here when we make a motion? Where does it? Where does this go? Is this is this the uh, end of the um, discussion, or does it go to council? This is a Jeff question, but it it this is it. But yeah, <laughs> the uh, the conditional use goes to council. Uh, what we talked about earlier, but the site plan is yours. Yours decision as plan commission. So again, it. Uh, I think it was John, right? The the owner of the property. John, you're okay with uh, the uh, assessment uh, that Jeff has put in, in front of us tonight? Absolutely. I wish Jeff could come with me to all my meetings. <laughs> <laughs> well, appreciate that, Mr. Halborough. Thank you. I understand he's not very cheap, so I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> well, we like to hear that. Uh, you know, especially uh, we are open for business, obviously, the city of Wapaka, but it makes it a lot easier when we have a, a good project to work with. Well, we feel the same way and staff has been receptive from day one. We've, we've really appreciated it. It's been a great experience. So we're, we're eager to get started. Um, just to give you guys kind of a, an update uh, on our end, um, we are in a position to, to move forward. So uh, with the necessary approvals, uh, we'll go ahead and uh, put together all of our construction drawings, submit them for permits. And our intent is to be under construction uh, in May. All right. 
Well, good luck. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, if there's no other questions, then uh, commissioners, uh, we'd be looking for a motion uh, on the site plan review. Olson to approve. Or Hold on a second. Are we motion. recommending? Uh, we have a motion by Olson, second by Keelan, that we approve uh, the site plan review for Aquapaw LLC at 1080 West Fulton Street. Any discussion? Just a voice vote here. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against? Anybody that would like to abstain? All right, uh, motion carried again. Good luck to you guys. We certainly appreciate it. Thanks for all of your help. Yep. Yeah, it. All right, let's uh, move on to another site plan review. Then we have Home and Away Ministries Incorporated, which is also on Fulton Street, 705 West Fulton Street. Most of us uh, remember that as the old Cherney property. Okay. Uh, Jeff, I'm assuming this is you again. Yeah, sorry about that, Mr. Mayor, it is. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> um, let me preface this report by saying um, it's always easier to work with a blank slate than with an established property and established structure. So the previous applicants are looking at an existing site and basically starting from scratch. They're removing the structure. Um, they're really redesigning it from the ground up. Um, in this case, we're looking at, again, another established site with a large structure on it. Um, and since the structure is not being raised, it's about making sure that the site and the structure itself are compliant. And in this case, uh, the consultants that work with Ruby's Pantry, um, primarily Ms. Danielski and Bolt, and their, uh, their surveyor, um, who's, oh my goodness, I can't believe I'm forgetting your name, Matt, sorry. I can't believe I'm forgetting your name. Um, did, did a fantastic job working with us. There was a lot of back and forth over details. Um, again, when I think when Ruby's began the process of this property, it was under the old zoning ordinance. Now we have a new zoning ordinance. The requirements are uh, different. Um, they're certainly a bit more comprehensive. And well, I'll, there, there's my preface. We'll go from there. Um, in terms of zoning ordinance, uh, they're compliant with all the dimensional standards, but for the setbacks for the street and the rear yard. But again, these this is an existing structure. So it's an existing non-conforming structure, meaning it's accorded legal protection. Um, it can be updated, it can be added onto, um, as long as any additions don't further the intrusion into the required setback. So it's a, a compliant structure. Um, like the previous site plan, it's located within the Fulton Street Corridor. However, again, because the application came in before the Fulton Street Corridor overlay was established on the zoning map, um, the re specific requirements of the overlay could not be applied or imposed upon this site. Um, but again, they, they complete, as we'll see when you get to the site plan, um, we're starting from a place where we have a considerable amount of blacktop effectively I don't remember what the percentage is, but there were some grassy areas around some of the periphery of the site, but the vast majority was parking lot and structure. And I think when we look at the proposed site plan, you'll see a significant change there. In terms of the building design standards, one of the more significant challenges that the owners had to go through is complying with that requirement that the front facade extend around the sides of the structure, and they did so. Um, I don't believe we have a visual image of the, actually, I believe we do. Aaron, would you mind scrolling, scrolling down to the last page of the application? Um, just to say, again, those of you who live in the community, you're going to recognize it right away. Um, but what they're proposing to do is extend, and maybe that page didn't make it, Aaron. Yeah, let me look at the thumbnails here. Hold on. I believe it was the last page of my staff report, but it may have been omitted for some reason. I don't see it. It doesn't look like it. Okay. Well, for those of you who are familiar, it has a kind of a bluish, a royal blue, or maybe a deeper blue um, awning element that stretches across the facade. Uh, that will be extended um, on each side of the structure back 20 feet. To com there we go. Thank you, Aaron, to comply with the requirements of the zoning code. 
And uh, you'll notice that my staff report on the bottom of page two says no for compliance with the uh, screening of the mechanical equipment. Um, that is now a yes. Uh, Ruby's Pantry, the property's owner, property owners have submitted uh, an amendment to the application that shows the proposed screening. Um, they've, I think it was three or four different options that were provided. Um, each of those options, in my opinion, uh, meet the requirements for screening. In terms of the site design standards, again, everything is compliant with the current zoning ordinance. Jeff, then, you're talking when you're talking about the screening. You're talking about the uh, what's on the roof. Yes, sir. The air yeah. conditioning and other kind of HVAC and utilities up on top of the roof. That's correct. Okay. Is there any plan to have any units uh, on the on sides the side of the buildings building or behind the buildings? Behind the buildings? Uh, I will defer to Mr. Kinsley if he'd like to answer that, but not to my knowledge, certainly not as part of the discussion of the site plan review. Yes, this is Paul Kinsley. Um, on the west side of the building, so it would be on the, the left side there, you see that yellow marker there? That is going to be, that is gonna be uh, cooling, cooling equipment that needs to be set up for the use of the um, of the freezer that's going to be installed there. That that is going to be completely covered by cedar fencing, I believe is what we're going to do with that. And uh, out of sight for, for anybody with regards to uh, what is stored inside. Okay, so nothing on the east side though, like they like Cherney had in the past. No, those houses. There's not going to be anything on the east side on the on the ground. And actually what we're looking to do uh, you can see those red marks on there. We're hoping in, in, in working right now, trying to figure out which is going to be more cost effective, whether to have all that uh, equipment on top of the building that came from Cherney removed uh, and then just have the, the two new uh, power, 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 uh, power plants that are going to be on top of the roof covered with the screening. So we won't know exactly about that. If these have to stay on, then we will have them screened completely. But if, if we can get them off, then um, then we will take care of that also. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Aaron, Aaron, can you bring up the, oh, there's a screening, there are some of the proposed screening options for up on top of the roof. Um, Aaron, can you bring up the actual site plan that shows the proposed landscaping? Yep, just give me one second. Yeah, while you're doing that, uh, can I ask a kind of a loaded question here? I, um, so with the idea that they're using this building and they're going to do the refrigeration inside, are there going to be any refrigerated trailers that are going to be sitting out in the parking lot and, and running? Well, um, we've, I'll let you speak to that. I think I have an answer, but uh, I'll let you speak to the operations side of Ruby's. Well, I I, um, I will give that over to Lynn, but my I'll, I'll give you my, my thought process on this. We, we've got uh, four doors that are going to be, or five, five bay doors that are out there, uh, and the, um, the trailers we have that are presently running at our at our current site um, are all electric, but the purpose the the chances of that happening would be extremely slim because we now have refrigeration within this building, refrigeration and freezer capa capacity. So there's not going to be any reason unless it's an emergency or an overflow of uh, having trailers out there running overnight. Lynn, maybe you've got something to say about that. Can you hear me okay now? We can. Uh, okay. We also have a big storage facility freezer in Stevens Point that we've been using. 800 pallets in that place. And so if we fill up our freezer here, we are going to be using still using Stevens Point. 
because our freezer we're putting in only holds about 400 pallets or maybe 500, but somewhere's in that range, I think. And the only other thing that I mentioned is that if we have a truck that comes in at night and the freezer is full and everything, and they've got to wait or they can't get it on a loaded when the truck comes in or something like that, there's a possibility of a freezer trailer running outside overnight or if it comes in late till morning or something like that. But that's not a normal thing. But I just want to mention that possibility so we don't want to uh, mislead anybody in any way. But that would be the only time that a freezer trailer would be running outside. And, and that being the case, if that were to happen, that freezer unit would be running on the west side of the building, uh, pointing towards Neville's, not towards uh, uh, private properties on the east side. Correct. Thank you. Thank you for being candid with me. <clears throat> Jeff, with, now that we have the site plan up, do you want to go ahead and go through kind of some of the components that are shown on here, specifically the uh, parking? Uh, Justin will eventually go through the turn template and then also the 25% um, the green space requirement. Sure. Um, so if you look at the yeah. drawing right now, the, I'm Jeff. sorry. Go ahead. Yes, Before you start, uh, could you explain why why uh, we have uh, what, what the red lettering means? Is that something you put in or who put that in there? Uh, the red lettering is from the consultants for Ruby's Pantry. Okay, thanks. You're welcome. So if you look at the dashed red line that kind of diet goes from a, a northeast to a southwest um, angle in the northwest corner of the property follows along the western boundary down to the bottom. Uh, that's indi that indicates existing asphalt that will be removed. Um, and again, I think those of you who drive drive by this property frequently, <clears throat> right now it's mostly asphalt. There's a little bit of grass associated with the the northwest corner, the south and the southwest and south part of the property. Uh, but the vast majority is blacktop and it's it's going to be a little bit more challenging to envision what this looks like when it's done uh, but what you're going to see is much much more green um, 25 plus percent of the property will be greened up uh, including additional trees planted along the northwest corner uh, if you notice on the eastern property line there is a double row of arborvita fast growing arborvita tree or shrubbery um, I think if I remember correctly, the maximum height on, or the full grown height on those is somewhere between 18 and 20 feet or maybe 12 to 18 feet. Um, they fill in pretty quickly. So anybody viewing this property from offsite, particularly to the east, uh, will see the top of the structure, but will not see much of the internal workings or the kind of the eye level workings of the building itself. Um, and again, I think the consultants for Ruby's Pantry did a really, really good job of meeting our landscaping requirements within the site plan review element of the zoning ordinance. Uh, as far as the parking goes, um, same situation. Uh, they increased the parking. They're meeting the ADA requirements for accessibility. Um, and I will defer to Justin with respect to uh, traffic flow and parking flow on the property. Sure, thanks, Jeff. <clears throat> so this site in the past was um, Trini Cheese, as we all know, the number of trucks that came in and out um, was much more than what Ruby's Pantry is uh, proposing now. Um, regardless, I did reach out to DOT and got their opinion on this. And then we also discussed with Strand Associates, who's our uh, consultant engineer that helps us with our site plan reviews. Um, <clears throat> both DOT and Strand do not have issues with these turning movements. Um, the right turn in, so coming east on Fulton and turning right in, and if you can slide to the left a little bit, Aaron, please, shows that um, the concern that, that came up was, well, the turn in, you get very close to the building, you know, if, if a truck driver is not paying attention, um, could strike the building. That was the major concern. Uh, the other concern that that did come up internally was, uh, in order for this truck to make this swing, um, that's uh, that section of Fulton Street there is technically one lane. 
However, it's a it's a wide one lane as you know as, as all you who are local know. Um, just west of that is the signals. That's four lanes or two lanes on each side, and then it narrows down to one heading east. Um, that is in that transitional area. Um, <clears throat> We had a little bit of concern with possibly a car trying to sneak past this truck as it was slowing down. Uh, it would bow out to the center line and come back to the east. Um, DOT and Strand did not have those concerns. Um, there are some things that could happen um, if this becomes an issue in the future uh, as far as additional striping or moving the curb, but um, adjusting the curb line, excuse me. Um, at this point, we didn't feel that that was necessary um, or maybe within our bounds of, of um, I guess, within the plan review. Uh, the turning movement exiting, if you can slide down a little bit, Aaron. Um, much less of a concern, just the sheer number of vehicles, I guess, leaving or the, the trucks leaving. Um, we just didn't we didn't have much of a concern with that being a conflict uh, with traffic in either direction. And Thanks, I think this, this is important to talk about, obviously, in the site plan review. Um, and Justin, thanks for giving the overview of all that. But Jeff, correct me if I'm wrong. We'll also talk about this with the conditional use permit of the distribution center, correct? That's correct. So we are awaiting the adopter, the updated zoning ordinance establishing the distribution center as a permitted use in the I-1 district, uh, I-1 light industrial district. Uh, once that happens, it becomes a conditional use within the FSC district. So a conditional use permit will be required and any safety issues associated with um, uh, the parking regime that uh, parking and in ingress egress regime that Justin just described could be addressed or will be addressed within the CP. In addition um, to how it's addressed here. Um, can I ask Justin? Justin, this is Pat. Is is there a, a uh, an exit to this property onto Union Street in the back? There is not. Um, not currently, no. Okay. Thanks. I, I, I only mention that because remember there was some discussion of using this property for a different uh, different uh, project and there was talk about uh, having a back exit. So I wasn't sure if that was in this plan at all. Yeah, yeah. you know, I, I know where you're going on that. You're, I mean, a lot less cars back there. You would have a lot less to worry about. You know, if you know, you know Union Street and it snakes to Bailey and then to Smith Street, um, up a hill, down a hill, up a hill again. I think that's a terrible condition for trucks to be on. Um, our roads back there are not as robust as Fulton Street. Um, so I, I think if, if given the option of using Union Street versus Fulton Street, I would say use Fulton Street. Okay, thanks. Yep. Uh, nothing more on my end, Mr. Mayor, unless there are other questions from the Plan Commission. Anybody else have any questions? Uh, again, this is for the site plan review. Um, and uh, so my only comment about the, the turning in and out there, I, I mean, I drive that every day, usually three times a day, quite honestly, going back and forth. And uh, there's going to have to be some education done. Um, but, you know, the good news is there is stop and go lights right by Neville Motors. So that will give us interruption of traffic there. But it also means that when you have stop and go lights, uh, people think they're in the Daytona 500 when the <laughs> turns green too. So we'll have to be a little cognizant of that. But, I, you know, I... I I certainly think people will get used to it. I think it's just going to take a little while for people to get used to a truck being in the left lane and, and turning right. And I, I still disagree with Justin that that's not one lane. That's actually two lanes that are in front of Cherneys. And that's how, that's how they treat it. I don't care if there's a dotted line there or not, but it's being treated as two lanes. So the lane that would be on the right side or closest to the Cherney is used for the through traffic that goes down 
to Main Street. So we're going to have to be careful there. And and again, I I just want to make sure that I that the the idea of the refrigeration trucks on on the property I think is something that uh, we are going to monitor, and we we hope that uh, we don't see that happen. Uh, at all, but uh, at the very least, uh, very minimal uh, on the property. And Mr. So, Mayor, if that is a concern that is uh, shared by the plan commission, that's something that could be addressed within the conditional use permit as well. All right. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. Uh, otherwise, I mean, I, I, you know, quite honestly, I, I don't want to, I don't want to make this sound like it's negative because it isn't negative at all. I, I thank them for taking a building that's been sitting vacant for many years, you know, and, and, and going to occupy it if everything goes through properly. And, in in you know, and this is kind of our main road that goes into the, our community. So it will be nice to have something active going on in this building. So I, I really do thank them for, for doing this project, quite honestly. Can, can I follow up with that, Mayor? Um, this is this is a, a project that is not being built, but rather, as Jeff uh, pointed out, this is an existing structure. When when are we looking at as commissioners that this project will be fully operational? I mean, when when are we talking about trucks actually turning in and delivering? I mean, the other one, uh, the other project, obviously, um, we know it has to be built first. This is not the case here. What's the status in terms of the use of this building, assuming it moves forward? This is this is Paul Kinsley again. I, I can answer that question for you, sir. Um, we, we're looking to actually get started once this conditional use permit is approved and gone forward. Our start date will be sometime after the 20th of April as far as the reconstruction. And it is our hope that within 90 to 120 days from that point, we will actually have activity and in, in moving in and out of that building. So, and just to, just so everyone's clear on timelines, Pat, um, the, the conditional use permit cannot be applied for until April 20th, because that is when everything gets finalized from a council standpoint with the Fulton Street Corridor and the distribution center aspect added to it. Uh, so from that time, we'll run through the timelines from application submittal to then that coming to plan commission and getting approved by council. Um, and uh, yeah, and after, and I, I, and after that, it, it follows Paul's timeline. Now, the, the one thing I do want to mention, I think it's important that plan commission is aware of, is that Ruby's has been working with Jane Drager, our commercial building inspector, and they have gotten some approval before that time for some demolition work. I think there's some minor, some walls that need to be demoed and a, and a couple other things. I think it's fairly minor, but that's something that we would work with any building owner on um, even before a conditional use permit. We would not grant building permits for alterations for the future use until that conditional use permit is granted. But Jane has been working with them on, the, on a couple demo things. So if you do see some activity going on there before April 20th, uh, just know that that's what that is. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thanks. Uh, Justin, you did have your hand up before, but I see it's down now. You still have a comment? Uh, I just wanted to point out, and I don't, excuse me if Jeff mentioned this, but that red line, if you can zoom in a little bit, Aaron, um, that to the northwest of that red line is right now is all blacktop pavement. Um, my understanding that they're going to rip all that out and make that a green area around the whole site. So that red line is basically to the east of that is pavement, the existing pavement, everything to the west of that is new green grass. So on top of the landscaping that they're adding. So we, you know, we just got done talking about the coffee shop on the west side with a fantastic landscape, increased greenery. Well, the same thing is happening here on the other bookend of Fulton Street. Right. Good comment, Justin. It's basically one third of the entire facade or the entire frontage of this property is going to be green. Better than half of the property is going to be the existing facade elements of the structure. And then you get to the eastern side of the property and you have 
a tree line or a shrub line that extends the entire, almost the entirety of the of the side lot line. So the image of this driving by it, once this is fully built out, once the greenery is established, it's going to be a significant change from what the current situation is. So I agree. When you when somebody pulls into Fulton Street Corridor, they're going to see um, the coffee shop on the left, and they're going to see Ruby's Pantry on the right. So I think the city's lucky right now that we have these two projects at the beginning of this, whatever, this path that we're going to be traveling towards a, a re-envisioned Fulton Street Corridor. They're, both of these projects are setting the bar for everybody who's going to follow. Yeah, no, I think that will be, that's a nice uh, uh, addition to that property, quite honestly. And we've talked about that at the staff level and the mayor's yeah. level. Um, so I much appreciated that they're looking at doing that. Uh, I'm not sure who this is, but there's uh, Paul Kinsley that was on. Did, did you have a comment that you'd like to make, Paul? No, I, there's no comment I, I want to make. I, I tried to answer the questions that uh, came up there, but uh, we, we've tried very, very diligently to, to work in conjunction with the city, and we appreciate all that the city has done to, to help us move through this. It hasn't been an easy project with some of the things that we've had to run into, but yet you've stuck with us, and, and we've tried to accommodate the things that you asked us to. We're excited to get started in here. Um, this is not going to be something that's, going to have 100 employees working in it. We're going to go basically with our similar staff now that we have at our other site in Wapaka. Uh, it might expand a little bit, but um, we're anxious to get there because we can, we can serve more people and do a better job uh, with, with our job and our projects by working out of this building. So we would like to thank you for that. All right. Thank you. Thank you for those comments, Paul. And Mr. Mayor, yeah. if I may, I just want to send my apologies to Matt Ryder out there, wherever you are, for absolutely forgetting your name at the beginning of this. My apologies. Yeah. Yeah, this has been a long process, so I think both sides are are appreciative of, of everybody uh, sifting through the what's going on here. So I appreciate that. Uh, okay, so we're looking for... Uh, a motion on the site plan review if you're okay with uh, with the plan review with uh, Jeff's recommendations then I would uh, entertain a motion that we approve the site plan review Keelan moves to approve Olson second got a motion by Keelan second by Olson that we approve the site plan review for Home and Away Ministries Incorporated at 705 West Fulton Street. Any other discussion? Again, we'll do a voice vote here. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against, say no. Anybody that would like to abstain? All right, uh, motion carried. Uh, good luck. It sounds like we'll see you again next month here with the conditional use. Thank you right. so much. You guys have a great evening. You're Thank welcome. you, guys. Thank you. All right, and it looks like uh, we're going to talk about, uh, next up, we're going to talk about uh, changing how we do the site plan review and the submittal and the approval. <laughs> and uh, Aaron, I'm assuming this is ordinance, so you probably want to set this up here for us. Yeah, so this is um, this part is not an ordinance. It actually didn't have anything within the packet. So I'm going to scroll back to the agenda so people don't get confused. But this is a, and Jeff will step in on this one as well. Um, so as we've adopted the new zoning code, we have a site plan uh, submittal and approval process that we go through with the change of occupancy of businesses and commercial properties. And not only the change of occupancy, but the change of use um, so if it goes from a, if it goes from a fast food restaurant to a, a doctor's office, whatever it might be, um, that would trigger a site plan review. Um, but sometimes there may not be redevelopment or development happening on that parcel or that property. Um, and we wanted to have a conversation with you about those submittals that have never come to plan commission in the past. Um, could we do those? internally, is plan commission comfortable with that? 
you, that would expedite the process and, and is not something you guys are used to seeing anyways. And then sending it to plan commission uh, for more of those uh, redevelopment or larger uh, issues. But I'm going to, that's kind of setting it up. And, and Jeff, I'll turn it over to you for um, a little more detailed explanation. <clears throat> Yeah, thanks, Aaron. I'm not sure I'm going to provide a whole lot more detail. Um, as Aaron said, we have uh, districts where there are many, many uses that are allowed. And in some cases, um, as we proceed forward, uh, multiple uses potentially allowed within the same structure, certainly on the same property. Um, so when we have a structure that has multiple units and <clears throat> It's, it, it may have gone through a site plan in the past and been approved. Uh, maybe it doesn't have an approved site plan associated with it. A new tenant comes in, there has to be some means by which staff can ensure that that new tenant and the use that and that new tenant brings is compliant with the zoning ordinance, is compliant with the building code, and compliant with all, their, all, all other aspects of the city code. And there's no real way of doing that without establishing this requirement under site plan review that not only does it apply for all new uses on a, on a property and all new structures, but the change of use of an existing property or existing structure. So it's just a, it's basically closing, not so much a loophole, but a crack that things can fall through. And we're hopeful that, um, that by not bringing it before plan commission, we're not going to be overburdening someone who's probably fully compliant with uh, the intended use of a structure from having to wait until the next plan commission a month later and go through that entire process. So um, I think, uh, I, I, as Aaron said, I think the ball's in the plan commission's court to determine whether you're comfortable with um, with the zoning administrator, economic development director, DPW, and the building inspectors to review this and determine that it's compliant, not have it go before plan commission. So. Okay, so what are we looking for tonight? Is it, was this just uh, the idea, just telling us uh, what the plans are for the future, or is there something that we need to do in writing here to, to make these changes and yeah so mayor per our code we, we would need plan commission to to direct staff to take care of those types of submittals and applications so if you could make a, a motion or an action to do that that would be our recommendation okay and so to help me out again uh so would the commission be giving anything up here that uh, we would feel uncomfortable with doing? Not that you would do this on purpose, but I just want to make sure that we are on the same page here. Yeah, I know you're getting that, Mayor. Um, I, I, in all honesty, no, I don't think so at all. Um, it's, it's not taking away anything from plan commission that they had previously had um, from a review standpoint. Okay. All right, so if uh, commission is okay with that, then we would be giving approval to the staff to move forward with uh, the handling of the site plan review submittal uh, according to what how Jeff had explained that. And that would include a report to plan commission periodically? You know, they're killed, that would be um, plan commission's prerogative, but absolutely. Because we would we'd still go through the process of staff review and production of a staff report. And we can certainly send it to plan commission. That way you'd be able to see it and say, you know something in this case, uh, we think this is something that should become before, come before plan commission. We're yeah. trying to make sure we're not building in a 30 plus day um, wait period for something that Aaron and I don't suspect the plan commission would want to review anyway. Um, we're trying to make it a little bit more user, make the process a little bit more user friendly when we're looking at new uses that are almost certainly not going to have uh, an impact on the structure or the site itself. I'm going to make just a suggestion here, uh, Alan, because this is kind of new to us and we're gonna be going through these internal reviews that we're not sure of the volume quite yet. Um, so why don't we put it on as like a, a report at the end of plan commission agenda for these first few months 
and we'll see what that looks like. And then you guys can give us direction on you want to keep seeing the reports or or not. Yeah, I think that's a great idea, Aaron. Um, I'd like to see this kind of stuff pushed down to staff level rather than coming to, to commission all the time. So I'm in favor of it, um, but I would like to have that feedback on a monthly basis. Okay, that sounds great. Well, I'm, I'll am i make the motion. I'm not quite sure how to phrase it, but I will make the motion. Well, just make the motion and we'll, we'll make it up after you make the motion. No, I'm just <laughs> kidding. <laughs> so really what we're doing is, is we're, we're allowing, you're making a motion to allow the staff to handle the planning, uh, the plan review submittal. And so it does not have to go through, through the planning commission uh, for, for approval. Uh, it would be specific to a change in use of an existing structure, right, Aaron? That's correct, yes. Good, that's the motion I made. Yeah, that's what I thought. So I'll second it there. I'm sorry, who seconded that? Uh, Fair did. Okay, so we have a motion by Keelan, second by Fair, that we approve this agreement. Uh, any discussion? I do, I do think Alan's comments are are good. Uh, you know, at the end of the meeting, Aaron and Jeff and Andrew, for that matter, too, you guys do uh, give us uh, reports. And I, I think having that under the reports would be important, at least at least at the very beginning, so that we understand. OK, uh, ready to vote uh, again, voice vote here. All in favor, signify by saying aye. Aye. Against, say no. Anybody that would like to abstain, motion carried. I got a question, Mayor. Yeah, go ahead, Justin. You can put your hand up. Sorry, you guys cut out there for a second. I just wanted to make sure I had the motion right to allow staff to handle plan review submittals for change of use for existing structures. Do we need to specify the zones or is that good enough? Jeff, are you, uh, or are you thinking or? Um, well, actually I was thinking about Robert's rules and the fact that a motion was made and seconded and I'm not sure if um, we can make a change to it. <laughs> but, I don't, I don't think he's asking well, for a change. He's just actually asking for a clarification. He's taking the notes for the meeting. So he, yeah. he wants to make sure he understands what the motion was, Jeff. That's all. Understood. Um, I, there was, Justin, would you mind reading that back or restating that again? To allow staff to handle plan review submittals for change of use for existing structures. That's what mm -hmm. I have written down. Correct. And then Jeff, I, I just want to just want to make sure that this is sufficient. There's no changes ex, as far as written changes in the ordinance that need to be made to allow <clears throat> to allow for this. Is that correct? That's correct. The plan commission, every plan commission has the discretion to delegate aspects of its authority to staff. Um, so what you're doing here is you're the plan commission is identifying a certain category of site plan review and essentially saying that in most cases, this is not something that would warrant plan commission review and approval. Um, and we're deferring, we're delegating that authority to staff. If at some point via these reports that we'll be submitting, um, we get the, the plan commission and staff get an idea of the exceptions to that rule, those would then, or those could then still come should then still come before the plan commission. Uh, something similar, and I'm not sure if we were going to discuss that tonight, Aaron, but would be for um, these relatively small site plans that do involve a new structure or an addition to a structure um, that, again, may not warrant full plan commission review. I'm not sure if that's on the uh, discussion for this evening as well. I don't think I don't think it is. Um, no, but I I don't unless it's under F, Jeff, but I know you put that together, but just to maybe not further complicate things. Okay, for tonight. For further complicating. No, oh, that's all right. So, 
So you, you got that motion right, Justin? You feel good about that? Okay. Okay. Uh, e is, uh, we are, I, I should have said this at the beginning of the agenda. Sorry about that. But E, we're actually tabling this till our next meeting. And uh, Aaron's going to talk about our April meeting a little bit later here. But um, so you could just cross that off your list for tonight. Uh, they're not, we're not prepared tonight yet to, to, to uh, discuss that. So we're going to just put that on hold. So we're, we're to F, which is ordinance number 04, 2021. And this is an ordinance amending chapter 17, uh, which, uh, well, go ahead, Aaron. Yeah, so this is, a, again, this is a part of the phase two changes. We're continuing with those phase two changes and cleaning up the original um, code that was adopted in uh, November. Um, and Jeff has laid out what those changes are, um, and we're going to ask for action at the end of the night and a little discussion on a, on a couple of them. But Jeff, go ahead. I'll turn it over to you. Uh, yep. Yeah. Uh, members of the Plan Commission, we presented this at the last Plan Commission meeting. I uh, talked about the various changes. Um, there, as Aaron mentioned, there's one that will require a little bit of discussion because we do have some uh, a more firm recommendation. To the Plan Commission. Uh, that's regarding signs. But with respect to everything else, um, you have the report in front of you. And instead of, I guess, in the interest of you not having to listen to me continue to talk, um, are there any specific questions you have associated with the recommended changes? I believe we did a pretty decent job of discussing most of this, if not all of these, at our last meeting. So, uh, okay. okay, thanks, Jeff. No, I so where we're at uh, with the ordinance then is, uh, you know, um, this is something that then gets recommended to city council. If city planning commission is, uh, is okay with moving forward with this, obviously it's a, it's a big encompassing ordinance and some of these things have not been tested yet. So, we, we might be back in a month or two to discuss some of the things that uh, maybe need some tweaking at that time. But uh, I'm hearing that nobody has any objections to, to and is okay with the way it's written right now. I just have one, one question, Jeff. Uh, the, the conversation around the signs and the, the sizes of that, I know you had it this week with some staff. Um, that is going to be coming forward at the next meeting. Is that correct? Actually, that was something I was hoping to discuss tonight. Okay. Is that in this as a part of this agenda item? Well, it, uh, yes, it's not included in the materials that were provided to the plan commission. Is it appropriate to talk about that or then or not? Well, is well, it, are the signs a part of this ordinance? Cause then I would say, yes, it is. And I think the plan commission directed us at the last meeting to come back with perhaps some revisions to the signed regulations uh, with respect to various districts. And we have those recommendations now, but they weren't prepared in writing for this meeting. So that's the, I guess that's the procedural part of this I'm asking or questioning. So I have, a, I guess I have a recommendation here to do, do um, this is something that we would need action on just like we would for for this jeff correct for for what we have in writing correct because it'd be a change in the in the zoning code as far as the signage um square footage regulations that you guys are proposing correct but if the plan commission is if, if the end result of tonight's meeting is the plan commission is making a recommendation to take the ordinance that we're proposing to public hearing, we can certainly include additional amendments prior to the public hearing as long as they're posted. Okay. That, okay. Sounds good. So then we can have the discussion tonight and it can be part of this round if the plan commission would like it to be part of this round. 
for for what it's worth, I I would. It's my opinion that I think you should go ahead and discuss it, so then we can move it along with everything else, uh, and we can get their opinion, and maybe they'll have different opinions. Um, Isn't that kind of what I said five minutes ago? <laughs> it was, but I wanted to make sure I understood it. So yeah, okay, it's exactly. So a, a repeat of what Mayor Smith said five minutes ago. All right. Check. The, the, the issue at hand uh, was ground signs and multi-tenant signs. And as plan commission may recall, the zoning ordinance that was adopted in November of last year um, increased the maximum square footage in terms of single side face area. So the increased the size of a ground sign, a sign that is mounted to a pole or monument on the ground um, from, from what it was previously. And it did so in a way that actually raised some questions that um, I should have focused on more when we went through this process, certainly internally with staff, uh, but also with the plan commission. So the, the question before the plan commission at the last meeting, the question that staff went through was, are the current regulations, did we go from being too restrictive to too permissive? Um, under the current zoning ordinance, in the vast majority of business and commercial districts with a street frontage of 100 feet or less, um, you can have 100 square feet of sign area on one side of a sign. So you could have a sign that is basically 10 by 10. Um, and the concern there is within a number of districts, particularly the B1 neighborhood district, B2 central business district and B7 riverfront district, that signs of that size are inappropriate. The scale would just be too large for that setting. Um, under the current ordinance, if you have a frontage um, in excess of 100 feet, you can go to 150 square feet in sign area. So again, one of those things where looking at existing ordinances and other parts of the state, it seemed like a a reasonable next step. I think um, it was probably two or three steps too far. So what staff, what, um, staff did was sit down and talk about these and try to come back to something that seemed more reasonable. And as it turns out, the answer that we coalesced on was the were the sign standards that applied prior to the 2006 rewrite of the zoning ordinance, and that is. Um, within the within the B1, B2, and B7 districts, the maximum face area would be 50, 5, 0 square feet. For all other business and industrial districts, it would be 100 square feet. The recommendation we have is that for multi-tenant signs, it would be a cumulative measurement. So if you have a multi-tenant sign with three units, basically three signs associated with that multi-tenant sign. Under the current ordinance, the way it exists today, each one of those signs could be 100, feet, 100 square feet in size. And I don't think that was the intent of the plan commission when I drafted this. Now it would be 100 square feet cumulatively. So that could be you know, 33, 33, 33 or it could be 60, 20, and 20. That it would be up to the property owner to determine um, how large each, each of those signs could be. And then the final thing we looked at was uh, the existing setbacks. And at present, under the current ordinance, under the previous ordinance, the setback from the road right of way was equal to the height of the sign. And we talked about it, and in the end, we decided that that was, in our opinion, that, was, that remains the appropriate setback. So summing it up, what we're looking at for the plan commission to consider is all ground signs um, within the B1, B2, and B7 district would have a maximum single side face area of 50 square feet. All such signs in all of the other business and industrial districts would have a maximum face area of 100 square feet. And if it's a multi-tenant sign, it would be the cumulative square footage of all those signs that could not exceed the 50 square feet in B1, B2, B7, and 100 square feet in the other ones. Any comments uh, from uh, commissioners on this? Are there any businesses that took advantage of that 
between the time we changed it till now? That's a great question. Not as of yet. Um, and the main reason for that, I think, is it's a pretty big sign. <laughs> I mean, a 100 square foot sign in the B2 district is a pretty large sign, which means it's a pretty costly sign. So I think there is a built in constraint just in the cost. Um, we looked at we looked at a lot of existing signs to determine whether moving forward with these recommendations would create nonconformities of existing signs. And as it turns out, the answer was almost entirely no. We found one sign that exists out there uh, that is currently, I believe it was 98 square feet in size. Um, if we approved, if the plan commission and council approved the recommendation, uh, they would be in excess of the 50 foot requirement, but it would be a non-conforming sign. So it, it would be allowed, you could, it could be retained into perpetuity as long as there were no structural changes to the sign. All the other signs that were non-compliant, including, and forgive me, is it the Ramada, Aaron, is that correct? Yes. I believe the Ramada sign is something like 288 square feet. So that was, that was a non-conforming sign under every past iteration of the zoning ordinance, and it would remain a non-conforming sign now. Again, that means they can retain it, they can maintain it, they can change the face on it, but they can't make structural changes to it. And if they ever did decide to replace the sign, uh, the new sign would have to comply with the existing regulations, whatever they'd be at that time. So, Ms. Sage, the short answer to the question is not that we're aware of. Nothing has come before us that would have been, that was approved under this under the current sign regulations that would not be approved under what we're recommending. Thank you. You're welcome. Again, I, you know, signs have been a bone of contention as we discuss this at the planning level. I think it's more maybe just trying to figure it out. And, and I think I've relayed this to you and everybody else. I, I, I'm, it's a little tougher for me because I, as I've said, I, I don't know that I found a sign that I don't like. So, you know, it's, it's one of those things where, uh, we'll, again, we'll, we'll have to see as we move forward, uh, if, if this does affect how people want to handle doing things on, especially multi-tenant properties. Yeah, it, signs are unquestionably the most difficult aspect of a zoning ordinance to administer and enforce. There's nothing, you know, second place is a long, long way back. Yeah. All right. Thanks, Jim. You're welcome. Anything else on the, on the ordinance uh, 04-2021 uh, that uh, we're being asked to recommend to council? All right, I, I guess I would ask that uh, that we uh, that we get a motion to approve uh, or to move this ordinance to the council level. So move for approval, Fair. Olson second. A motion by Fair, second by Olson that we recommend to council ordinance number 04-2021. And this is an ordinance amending Chapter 17 of our code. Any further discussion? Again, this can just be a voice. Um, Mayor, does, yep. Mayor, does this have to have two readings? It does at the council level. I, I also think it it has to have a public hearing too. I, I unless there's something that I'm missing here. But uh, no, sir, Mr. Mayor, you are correct. It does have to have a public hearing. Okay. Okay. Thank you. All right. Uh, ready to vote. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against, say no. Anybody that would like to abstain? Motion carried. All right. Uh, next up, then, there. These are just a couple of discussion items. We have a uh, April planning commission meeting. Uh, Aaron? I'll take that one quickly. Thank you, Mayor Smith. Um, so 
We have uh, elections the beginning of April, which is going to push our council meeting on April 6th to April 7th, which is a Wednesday. Of course, that's our normal plan commission date. Um, so we're looking at moving that back. Uh, we have really two op. Well, we have a few options. Um, originally, I was going to actually push it back a couple weeks because we're not envisioning anything big coming in from an application standpoint that we need to review. So I was looking at actually Tuesday the 23rd, um, and that's only because on Wednesday the 24th of March, there's an airport board meeting. Um, another option, though, uh, we could do Wednesday the March 31st. Um, one of the items is likely going to be a conditional use permit that will have to get acted on by council anyways um, on the 7th. So I guess the only thing about that, la that the 31st is a lot of times there's not city meetings in the last week, but uh, it's, and sometimes people like to keep it that way, but it doesn't matter to me. So whatever you guys prefer, Wednesday the 31st or Tuesday the 23rd or anything else. If we can do it virtually, the 31st works for me. I'll be out of town. So, Alan, we are going to do the meeting in person, but, you know, under our, our new ordinance, uh, you are allowed to attend those and act and vote virtually. And that would be, you know, uh, there would be no issue with that, especially as we're trying to move forward. Uh, with trying to get back into uh, a meeting in person. The less people actually in the room, the better. So <laughs> it, it might be helpful if you did decide to not attend. Well, no, I've had both my shots. So Good. Good. All right. So what were those anybody? dates again, please? The 31st, 31st and the 23rd. And Alan already said 30... 31st could work for him. Uh, anyone else? Can we shoot for the 31st, or does, anyone, does it not work for anybody? Uh, uh, Aaron, this is Pat. Uh, the 31st works for me. The 21st, did you say? I can't remember the 23rd. 20, I, I think I'll be. I think I'll be gone on that date. So actually, the 31st would be better. I think the closer we get to the month of April, the better off we are, Aaron. So if we could make the 31st work, that would be awesome. Perfect. Let's shoot for that. March 31st is what we'll go with. All right. Normal time. Let us know anybody that cannot attend. And, and again, like I said, our plan is to meet in the council chambers for this meeting, uh, this next meeting that we're having. Uh, but you are still, if you want to attend virtually for whatever reason, uh, just let us know and, and we'll send you uh, a feed for that. Okay, uh, next up, this is again just for discussion, uh, but this has to do with uh, 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 discussion on a light ordinance. Uh, yeah. And uh, Aaron, I think you're going to lead this one too. That is correct, Mayor. Uh, so guys, as you'll notice, this is not an action item, as Mayor Smith said. Just wanted to kind of bring it up as I've been contacted by uh, one of our city residents uh, a number of times over the last several months uh, with a, a complaint that there's neighbors lights uh, spilling over into her home and, uh, and impacting um, through the windows and things. So I also know that this individual's reached out to plan commission members and reached out to at least a couple council members. Um, so staff has looked into this and I just wanted to make sure you guys were aware, especially getting some of this input on what this would have to look like for the city moving forward. And then at the end, look for some direction from you guys. So a light ordinance can be done in two ways. And one actually is on the front end, when there's a development project on a commercial piece of property, we can require certain lighting standards. Um, and another is in a public nuisance type setting where someone could give a formal complaint and then we would act on it. Um, now, I've reached out to, to many colleagues um, that hold my position and then also legal counsel on this and it, nothing's as simple as you would think. Um, so the, the, some of the challenges, I guess some of the advice we've received is 
is is it a public nuisance or is it a private nuisance? And if it's a if it's a one person issue and it's a um, you know if it's just relegated to that, it's almost always viewed as more of a private nuisance and it's a civil matter between two individuals. Um, now, if we found out that this was an issue with 10, 20 people within the city of Wapaka, um, you know, then maybe it is, it falls more under that public nuisance category and, and we would want to craft an ordinance to do something uh, to protect that. Um, the challenges with light ordinances are, are almost entirely in the enforcement aspect of it. Um, in speaking with legal counsel and speaking with Jeff, who has some knowledge in this and can probably speak to it a little bit, um, there has to be some form of measurement. So when you go to uh, say 102 and then 103 Division Street, let's say, um, you have to enforce it, it's not as easy as to ensure that they do not negatively impact the residential uses in the development, nor any adjacent residential uses. In no case shall lighting spill over onto an adjoining parcel. One of the amendments we recommended, one of the amendments you approved tonight, was to apply that to all commercial uses within the uh, city of Wapaka. So if, basically that says, if you were to stand at a property line and how do I say this? If you're if you were to be outside of a property that has external lighting and hold up a piece of cardboard, if that cardboard created a shadow, that property would be in violation of the light ordinance. Because again, the purpose of the lighting is to make sure that lighting is retained on, on site. What Aaron was alluding to in terms of the challenges associated with administration and enforcement of lighting regulations is how do you do it? You need light meters. You need to be there at certain periods of the time and take take uh, measurements over time. It is just it's really really difficult to um, provide evidence sufficient for a court <clears throat> to determine that a violation occurred. And that's the same with noise ordinances too. So it, it's just really really difficult to deal with um, lighting and noise within a public nuisance ordinance. It sounds to me like all we need is a piece of cardboard and a camera. <laughs> as, um, as long as we have regulations that prohibit a spillover of light, that's true. I think the situation that Aaron was describing is two residential property owners that are having, a dis or I should say a resident property owner who's having a disagreement with a neighbor regarding lighting on his or her property. Um, that's really, really difficult to regulate. Um, I mean, outside my window right down here, we have Edison lights, those kind of old fashioned string lights that look like, well, they look like Edison lights. You know, if one of my neighbors were to say, Jeff, I can't sleep at night, will you please turn those off? Um, if I turn them off, there's no problem. If I don't, well, then the owner of or my neighbor has to take other actions, right? Maybe it's buying expensive shades or maybe it's calling the police department. Um, it's just, it's really difficult to regulate that kind of use from a private standpoint. Now, if I had a floodlight on my garage and when that light went on, it shined onto my neighbor's property, that would be something different, right? Because now the light is crossing over the property line. My understanding of the issue at hand is it's somewhat different than that. I'm not sure if Aaron's back yet. So, I'm, I'm back. Sorry, guys. I got booted off. Um, Jeff, thanks for stepping up there. Um, <clears throat> so I just wanted, when I got back on, I heard Eric make, make the comment. It sounds like all you need is kind of a piece of cardboard and a camera. And that's a good, that's a, a good comment, actually. And I asked that question. Basically, you'd have to create an ordinance then that prohibited all light for, uh, to spill over across the property line. And then if you have an ordinance like that, how many homes or residential properties are in violation in the city of Wapaka? Um, and there's probably still some aspect of needing to measure that at some point um, when there's a fight in it. Is that's the at least that's what the advice uh, or the that I'm getting uh, when I reach out to our resources on it. Well, even if we could enact an ordinance like that, wouldn't there be grandfathering involved yet? Uh, Jeff is nodding his head there. I'll let him speak to that. No, Alder Keelan, that's absolutely correct. Um, uh, other than the nuisance element, so 
within a zoning ordinance, um, those regulations have to comply with all the enabling statutes that allow for local governments to adopt and administer and enforce zoning regulations. Nuisance ordinances fall under something called police powers. It's a different section or segment of laws. And those, there's no such thing as grandfathering under police powers. So if we could create a nuisance or, I'm sorry, if we could create lighting prohibitions, requirements, regulations within a nuisance ordinance, and if we could find a way to administer and enforce them in a way that a court would actually support, that would be the way to deal with this, um, particularly when it's a adjoining residential properties. Mm -hmm. With commercial properties, because there's much more of a need um, and a much a higher degree of frequency of permit requirements for commercial properties, anytime a commercial property would need a new approval for a building permit or an addition or site plan, it's at that point where we could compel compliance with lighting requirements. So when it comes to commercial uses, industrial uses, basically everything other than residential uses, I think the zoning ordinance is the right tool for the job. On residential properties, it's it's just, it's not. Um, new subdivision development, sure, but not in a mature city like the city of Wapaka. The only other thing I want to mention on this is that, um, or two things, one is, you know, I did ask the question, what, you know, if someone has a million um, candlelight shiner and they're shining it in your windows, like what, you know, where, what does that mean? And what's the correct action there? Well, the answer is then it becomes a legal or a criminal complaint and you'd call the law enforcement and they'd come and they would handle it at that point. Um, I think where's that line where it becomes a criminal complaint and a civil complaint? Well, it's probably, there's probably some judgment on uh, the law enforcement officer getting called to to the site uh, and how they're handling it. Um, I, I know I've just given a bunch of reasons that, you know, first I want to say I, I'm sympathetic to the, the person that has this, this challenge. Um, and I know I've given you a bunch of reasons that it probably would be my suggestion that with it being one individual case, I, I, I haven't heard of more than that. I would not recommend creating an ordinance at this time or drafting an ordinance, but um, I also realize that if it was planned commission's wishes to, to do something like that, we could, you know, we would, would obviously move in that direction. But um, so that that's the discussion I wanted to lay out there. Well, and, and just to add to that, Aaron, two things, one, um, and I, and I agree with you. It's, it's, it's one individual, um, but one comment about that individual, that individual is not going away. So we have to come up with a response for her mm -hmm. or him. Um, mm -hmm. and, uh, you know, even if we decide to do nothing tonight, you and I are still going to continue to get phone calls. Mm -hmm. you know? So we need to, we need to somehow respond to that. And two, We've worked hard, and I know, Pat, you've been one that's really worked hard on this, is when we have commercial property and we have parking lots that we don't end up with lighting pollution. Uh, and that's really what I call this, is is it's the, this lady that has the lighting on the adjoining property is, is, uh, is probably doing it for safety reasons, but it doesn't mean that it should carry over to her neighbor's window and and uh, um, and then I, I the other side of the corner. And then of course I think you know, can't you just go knock on the door and say, hey, do you mind your lights shining in my bedroom window or something like that? But that doesn't seem to be what what they they don't seem to get along. I guess so. That's not the answer either. Mm -hmm. Oh, Mayor, uh, this is Pat. You 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 alluded to a classic case we had a number of years ago. You probably remember we had somebody come in and complain that the street light was in their proper or in their house was too bright. I right. couldn't get the uh, street light to be moved. And in the same vein, a person who lives right on the other side said, "We want more lighting. We're older. We can't see when we come home at night." So you had both sides of the coin and one issue and one light. Yeah. Uh, so that's the problem. It really is. So, Aaron, I, we're going to have to come up with something, I think, to to try and 
figure this out. I, again, I, I don't like the idea of a light ordinance because, I mean, if I walk outside right now, I'll guarantee you my my neighbor's front light, if you put up a piece of cardboard and flash or whatever you said, it's it's going to be on my property, and that makes no sense to me whatsoever. So, mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. Well, 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 that sounds good. And we'll, I look forward to continuing to work and seeing if we can find a solution to this or, or any other individual matters that come up. And if something changes, we can always talk about it at another meeting, but, unless someone else has other opinions. But. Um, some of you know that I worked for Alliant Energy for 28 years, and my last assignment um, before I retired was the issue of street lighting. And uh, ultimately, we ended up instituting a plan that would create all of our street lights to shine downward, nothing that would shine up upward. So the light pollution um, shining upward was the issue at that time. The very first assignment I had when I joined that company was laying out the street lighting for all of Janesville. And so I've uh, some experience with, with lighting matters and I'd be happy to participate as if and when you might need me. Awesome. Hey. Aaron, can you give Alan the phone number? <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Alan. Yeah, Good thank. Job. No, really, thank you, Aaron. I'm not, or Alan. I'm not. Uh, I'm not saying that really. I'm just. Thank you. Appreciate that. I'll right. say that I've done quite a bit of research in lighting as well, so I'll give you a hand, Aaron. All right. Thank you. I guys. was trying to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's going. It's good to have willing uh, part, or participants. So thank you guys both. Great, thanks. Um, this is Eric. I just wanted to say I, I do appreciate uh, what you said, Mayor, that you're going to continue to check into this because uh, I did get the call and uh, I too am sympathetic and I am going to drive by there tonight just to see how that looks um, and if it's as bad as as the homeowner is saying then I think something definitely has to be done. I guess I'm not sure why in this day and age when you can buy motion sensor lights, why this homeowner has to have their lights on all night long. So I guess my suggestion would be to continue to work with uh, um, maybe the the person that has their lights on all night to see if if they just can't put motion sensors on it. We, we understand, you know, maybe they have a fear of, of uh, somebody coming onto their property, but motion sensor lights will take care of that yeah Agreed. this might be a silly question that i'm going to ask um does the homeowner know that this is a problem i believe i believe so angela yes yes she has, from what i understand eric and you can probably help me too um the person that's making the complaint has said that she has tried to approach her that's absolutely true. She told me she talked to her and they're just not willing to budge. Yeah. No silly questions. Uh, okay. Uh, next up then we have uh, under reports, we have our February building permits and code enforcement and development update. Aaron? Thanks, Mayor. I'm going to be really so, brief. Oh, Aaron, let me, before I go i i think tracy has already gone for the night i forgot wednesday is her night but uh tracy has uh stepped down as a commissioner after tonight and so i wanted to thank her you know and i and of course she's gone by now so if any of you guys do see tracy thank her for her years of help on on this commission she's been a nice addition to that and we'll miss her uh and then i know eric too you said that you might have to step off a little early too so go right ahead if you need to all right then i'm going to take off thank you yep see you see you Aaron, i will bid you adieu as well unless you need me for anything else tonight you guys are good thank you guys take care everyone be safe see you okay yeah. go ahead Aaron. all right thanks mayor so i'm going to keep this fairly brief i'm going to just touch on an interesting uh kind of statistic i came across yesterday when looking at building permits for 2020 in general. Nothing specific or, or really interesting from a February standpoint. I would say same with code enforcement status. Um, but just looking back at all of the building permits that were issued over 2020 to give you a sense of 
kind of how busy it's been, uh, over 500 building permits issued. Now, you know, that includes alterations. It includes, um, you know, HVAC, electrical permits, all of that. But, you know, that's well, well over a permit a day <laughs> for all those of you who are better than at math than me. Um, but that's pretty awesome. And we've already talked uh, at length about the new construction permits. Um, and then kind of going into the development side of things, I think the big update there is what we talked about last night at council. Um, City Council did approve a development agreement uh, with Green Tree Construction that will result in uh, the development of 29 lots in the Eastgate subdivision. Uh, that is all of the remaining lots in the Eastgate subdivision. Um, and the development agreement is predicated upon a 36 month time frame for them to get the incentive through the city. Um, if they get 20 homes built within that 36 months, it'll, that will trigger the incentive. If, if they fall short of that, it would not. Um, and that that's just a, a huge you know, step in the right direction for a lot of our goals. When we're talking about economic development. We've talked about fo a focus on housing and residents um, for these next several years. And, uh, and hopefully that can turn the momentum on the commercial side in year three, four, and five. Um, so when you look at, let's just say 29 homes get built in the next let's just say in the next year um, for argument's sake, that's, that's plus 20, 21 from this past year. We've got 56 um, units from a multi-unit complex. And then let's just say there's 10 more homes that aren't green tree. I mean, we're talking anywhere from, you know, 105 units to 115 units uh, being added over a couple of years. And um, that's a, just a, a credit to um, our staff who, Honestly, the, our building inspectors who are out there recruiting people <laughs> to build homes here when they're doing inspections and building more homes. Um, it's a credit to um, Andrew Dane and, and, and Justin, who all of them have extra work with all of these site per permits um, and just their ability to work with everybody. It's, it's been good. So that's, that's the big development update. Uh, and then really the, the other exciting news, you guys saw it tonight earlier in the agenda. So. Okay, thanks, Aaron. Aaron. I did have a question on uh, on the nuisance complaints. I noticed there were quite a few of them at Foxfire Court, and I wondered what that was all about. Uh, that was probably was it snow shoveling, snow removal. I don't know. It just said. Nuisance. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. So it is. It's um, the code enforcement. At, yeah, because there's a bunch of vacant lots out there, Alan. That every winter, um, really don't go shoveled. And then we have to address it. Was that on the uh, south end of the uh, Foxfire Court? <laughs> I think most of them were on the north, but I think there was one on the south end, if I remember correctly. I don't even know what the hell you guys are talking about. <laughs> you, you have to read the reports, Mr. Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> we, we need to we need to get rid of those reports. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah. Okay. Anything else for the good of the meeting tonight? Move to adjourn. Second. Motion by Keel and second by Fair that we adjourn. All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Against, say no. Motion carried. We're adjourned at 7 10 p.m. <laughs> <laughs>